Welcome to the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security Lecture and Webinar Series. On behalf of CHDS and our co-host today, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the International Association of Emergency Managers, the Naval Postgraduate School Alumni Association and Foundation, and the CHDS Association, thank you for joining us. Today, we're joined by NASA Deputy Administrator Jim Warhard as we discuss leadership lessons from the U.S. Space Program and those that are relevant to Homeland Security professionals confronting today's complex public health, emergency management, and public safety challenges. A couple of webinar administrative items to note before I turn it over to our moderator. All participant audio is muted during today's session and all questions will be held until after the initial remarks. Throughout this session, viewers are encouraged to submit questions using the Q&A box on your screen. We'll answer as many of your live questions as time allows, and we also received several questions from you before today's session, and we'll get to as many of those as possible as well. At the end of our program, there will be a short survey that's gonna pop up on your screen, and we ask that you take a moment to share your thoughts on today's session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Mike Walker is a subject matter expert and a frequent lecturer in our classrooms at CHDS, focusing on all hazard threats. Mike served 32 years in the federal government and was confirmed four times by the United States Senate to serve in senior executive branch positions. He was acting secretary of the Army in 1998 and also served as undersecretary of the Army in several other senior positions. Mike also served as deputy director of FEMA, and as Undersecretary of Veterans Affairs for Memorial Affairs when he retired from the federal government. Mike began his public service as a page in the U.S. House of Representatives while still in high school and later served as Staff Director of the Senate Subcommittee on Military Construction Appropriations when he was nominated in 1993 to join the Executive Branch by President Bill Clinton. Both Mike and our guest today, Jim Warhard, were among the founders of the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. So it's a great pleasure to welcome them back here to CHDS as they help us participate in a program that they helped create many years ago. Mike, now I'll turn it over to you and thank you for moderating our session. Thank you very much, Dawn. I think at the very beginning, I need to let everyone know that Jim Warhard is my best friend. We have been friends for more than uh, three decades. When we first met on Capitol Hill, we worked on the Senate Appropriations Committee. Now, over the years, Jim and I have not always seen uh, eye to eye on every issue. We worked for opposite political parties, but we have always had uh, spirited conversations. So hopefully today will be one of those. Now, Jim Warhard has been in public service uh, his entire career. He started at the Pentagon, at the Department of the Navy, and then he moved to Capitol Hill, where we both worked together on the Appropriations Committee. Jim became the staff director of the full Committee on Appropriations, one of the most powerful jobs on Capitol Hill. When Jim's chairman, Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska, retired, they started a law firm together. Jim was severely injured in the plane crash that killed Senator Stevens. And after rehabilitation, Jim returned to the Senate where he became the Deputy Sergeant at Arms, a position he held until President Trump nominated him to be the Deputy Administrator of NASA. Now, Jim Warhard understands our business, the business of Homeland Security. When he was deputy sergeant at arms, uh, he essentially oversaw uh, Senate Homeland Security activities, things like uh, continuity of government and uh, the uh, Capitol Police. And from his perch on the Senate Appropriations Committee, starting in the mid 1990s, Jim was way ahead of many of his colleagues because he not only saw the coming threat, he did something about it. For instance, Jim led congressional support for an expansion of the Office of Domestic Preparedness at DOJ. And he also is the father 
of the top off series of exercises. So when 9-11 happened, America was not nearly as unprepared as it would have been. Uh, today, we're going to talk with Jim about leadership lessons from NASA and how those lessons may apply to what all of us are facing today. So uh, Jim, uh, welcome and congratulations on recent very successful NASA missions and thank you very much for participating with us today. It's my great honor to be here with all of you and especially Mike Walker, who is, yes, my closest friend. We both have had long careers and, uh, you know, I think that's part of the leadership that you attain over time. You really keep collecting arrows in your quiver and it's trying to collect those arrows and learn as much as you can in each job you have. And the path is not straight. And, you know, it's not from point A to point B. There are times you're going backwards, sideways, you know, the deputy sergeant at arms job was not what I expected would ever lead me to be the deputy administrator of NASA. And yet, truly, it helped prepare me in many ways, uh, just running a large organization uh, with the many challenges it has. But, uh, but with that, why don't we start with questions, Mike, because I know we have a lot of them, and, uh, and then we can get into it. Well, the first question is, Jim, uh, how have you managed a complex organization like NASA during a pandemic, while at the same time achieving things like putting American astronauts back into space from the Kennedy Space Center for the first time in a decade and uh, launching the new Mars rover? How have you done that? You know, Mike, uh, you know, and again, this goes to how, how do folks that are on this, on this webinar actually, how do they lead and how do they manage? And those are two very different things. When I started at the Navy, as Mike mentioned, for me, I was in the controller's office and there was a clear chain of command. And there was also a clarity as to how the dollars fl flowed from the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations all the way down to the, the line sailor. We, I got to the Senate, was with Mike, and there were chains of command, but there were, they weren't always clear. There were subcommittees that Mike and I were both reporting to subcommittee chairman. We were reporting to full committee chairman. We were reporting to members on committees. Richard Luger was a storied senator from Indiana, and he uh, once said, you know, the Senate's like 100 carrier battle groups all deploying in different directions. And it was, you know, managing that type of situation when you're trying to manage a, a bill on the Senate floor uh, was great, great fun once you figured it out. Uh, but when you get to NASA, it was so different for me. Here I am, I'm, I'm parachuted in and I'm surrounded by engineers and scientists and just great, great people. And with passion and commitment, you just can't believe but the organization is a matrix structure. You've got centers like Kennedy Space Center, uh, like Johnson Space Center, and, and there, there are many others. You also have uh, a federally funded research and development corporation, the Jet Propulsion Lab. You, then you have mission directorates at headquarters that are working focused on science, work focused on human exploration, uh, focused on technology, developing technology, uh, and then a, support, a mission support directorate that really handles all the, you know, everything that's, you know, that's not so exciting, but you can't work without them. And they're just critical to, to the whole organization. So it was getting used to that matrix organization. And we also have what we call technical authorities, and they came out of some of the major challenges, such as the, the Columbia disaster. There was a, you know, a investigation board that, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, and they 
they said there was a lack of independent technical authorities. And so NASA, to their credit, created these authorities as part of the organizational structure. And uh, so you have the push and pull of the centers, the mission directorates, the technical authorities, and the leadership. And uh, But it leads to, it really creates a situation where you have to collaborate. It's not like the Navy where, where a admiral says, you're going to do this. There, there's a lot of discussion. And this matrix management, it, it wasn't created at NASA. This was invented in the 1940s and 50s. It was used to develop the B-29 and early ballistic miss missiles. Um, but I've gotten comfortable with it. And, uh, you know, my job is to understand the organization and to try to help them as much as possible while I'm in this position. So it's been a, a great joy to try to figure it out. So, Jim, how did the pandemic change all that? And how did you accommodate the pandemic still achieve these things? Yeah, thank you for asking. I forgot that part of the question. The pandemic, uh, you know, we got, and we all, all of us, all of us on this call, you know, you realize we're in the middle of it. And, you know, I started seeing, starting out with Ames Research Center, there were cases in the area, and then we had a case uh, at, on, at the center. Uh, it wasn't at the center, but it was a, an employee of the center. And we knew that this was coming. And as it started happening, you know, it was easy to close centers. It was, and headquarters. I mean, you just knew, you know, depending on what was going on in the local area that you had to close down. The hard part was how do you open up? And, and so we started, and the administrator, Jim Bridenstine, to his credit, you know, he's been the visionary really for NASA on the, on how we execute what the president has directed us to do. But going back to the pandemic, we, we, he had me write a return to site plan. And I say return to site, not return to work. Because with telework, which NASA had been doing for a long time, we just kept going. But, you know, Bridenstine looked at it and said, okay, we've got to continue with mission essential activities. And we also have to continue with launches that are going to happen this year. And with that, you know, we've been very, uh, today we're pleased to say we got our two astronauts back uh, this weekend, this, uh, this week. And uh, we're able to launch uh, Mars Perseverance to Mars last Thursday. Uh, and so it, this, has been, this has been a good week for us and hopefully for the country. Uh, but with that, I, I wrote this return to site plan. And the first thing, the first paragraph is, above everything else, the priority is the health and safety of our employees. And again, that's leadership. You've got to care about people before they're going to agree with you to follow with what your agenda is. And we knew that and we've kept to that through, through the pandemic. And we have, to, we have to continue to do that so that we continue as well as we can with the missions we have at hand. And we've got a lot more to come. But, but with that, then from there it was, okay, at each center, Ames, I mentioned Ames before, just outside, uh, uh, you know, Palo Alto area in California. It basically was, what are state and local health officials saying? And where are they? And, you know, what are the challenges in those areas? And we're really relying on state and local health officials. We also use the parameters set out by the White House on how to do it. but really we hinge off what the current situation is before we start getting a return to site. And in some areas we've gotten more involved at centers than we were, at some we haven't. It just depends on the local area's conditions at the time. And, we, and part of that report that I wrote was, you know, we could go back and forth. We all know there's a rise in different parts of the country right now. So we're getting more conservative in what we're doing. So you, you've got to be agile. And I think that's one of the things we keep pushing is this agility so that we can go back and forth as needed. 
again, health and safety of the workforce is paramount. And yet, uh, even dealing with all those restrictions, you have been able to meet all your mission uh, goals. That's frankly remarkable. I mean, that there, there's a lesson there for all of us. You, you know, Mike, uh, Jim Bridenstine, we saw with the Mars uh, Perseverance mission, and this is a rover uh, that is on its way to Mars. It's got a it, it's going to be looking for ancient microbial life. It's going to be collecting samples that are going to be picked up on another mission and returned to Earth. It's got a helicopter on it uh, that's going to, it's uh, four pounds and it's going to, we're going to see if it can fly. The density of Mars is 1% of that of the Earth's. So uh, I'm not saying it's going to fly. We'll see if it does. Uh, but we're really out there trying, and, and we hope if it does work, when we get astronauts there in the 2030s, this could be a forward scout for us. It could also be a communications relay. So we have a lot of different things on that rover. Um, but with that, we the folks that were do, doing the work on it were from all the different centers. And the bulk of the work was coming from the Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. And we sat down and said, how are we going to keep these folks healthy and, and not get sick? And so we started flying them back and forth to Kennedy to make sure that their their health and safety, again, was number one. And we we've been pretty successful in keeping them healthy. And they they did it and they got the mission done and it got on time uh, at one point. On a government aircraft. It was a government aircraft. Yeah. Which we don't normally do at these times. We are doing it, and, and again, it's continuity of operations. It's continuity of government. Uh, these missions are very important for what we're trying to accomplish uh, as directed by the president. Um, but, but with that, you know, let me be clear. We have a lot of other programs, and they are going to be affected, and it's cost and schedule. You know, this, we, yeah, we focused on this program, Mars Perseverance. We focused on the commercial crew that had our two astronauts just return. But we have other programs that are going to slip. Uh, we have a huge telescope that's going to replace or augment Hubble. And it is had a lot of challenges through the years. And, you know, it's been affected by, by COVID. And, and we've been, you know, part of leadership is transparency. We have to be upfront and honest with what's happening. And uh, again, the administrator has taught me, you know, in the Senate, we didn't talk to the press. We didn't share things because when you're passing an appropriations bill, somebody once said it's like a, catching a fish. It looks bright and shiny the first day, and by the third day, it starts to smell. Um, but, but with this, we have got to be open and transparent. And I, again, that's a part of of leadership that I urge you to embrace. Uh, well, Jim, these recent missions uh, underscore how NASA has embarked on this historic new public-private partnership, which is a huge change from the past. So tell us how NASA is evolving through these partnerships with the private sector and why that's the right approach now. You know, Mike, you think about it, you know, you and I are the right age to remember Apollo. And uh, I know you have got some really good stories yourself on Apollo. I hope you might share. But when we had the Apollo mission, we researched, we developed, we built, we launched, and we operated spacecraft and, and space capsules. Today, it's a very different construct. We just had, you know, SpaceX with Elon Musk launch they built and they launched a rocket and a capsule now they did it with our help and they were, they were great partners but we've gone together on this and we want to end up where there's competition and elon said this this week when we were with him he wants competition because it drives down the cost it increases innovation and those two things are so important along with the safety parameters that we all have to follow. But, but with that, the, the things that they did were amazing. The, the two astronauts is Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, and they embedded them into their manufacturing facilities. 
so that the line workers at SpaceX got to know them personally. It, they call them the dads because they're, you know, the folks at SpaceX are, are much younger than the dads. And, uh, but they got to be friends with them. And so they were personally, you know, invested in their safety. And so it was, it's just been a great, really great partnership. The program was created in the last administration, I might add. I've got to give them credit. But we carried it forward and executed it. Uh, and so Boeing is competing with SpaceX on this. And Boeing is, you know, we all know Boeing has had some challenges, to say the least. They sent up a rocket, and the rocket, as and it launched perfectly. But then the computer from the rocket started talking to the capsule and told it, to fire its its rockets to get to orbit, and it was premature. So they've had some IT challenges. They've got some quality control issues. They're working on them, and we're still hopeful that Boeing will launch too. Uh, you know, so that again, this is about having a space transportation system for humans, and we need the competition. So you know, we still we want Boeing to succeed. We want all these these efforts to succeed we, we need them this is a big tent as far as space goes you know and but think about it we have a debt and a deficit that are very high we want to be one of many customers to these these corporations and entrepreneurs so that they're providing the service and we're paying for it that's how we're going to go into the future and it's creating a space, we have a space economy, we've created it in low earth orbit. We're looking to expand that space economy. With this transportation system, we expect that you will start seeing uh, commercial space stations. And I say that because right now, when we get the full complement of a crew back on the International Space Station, we have one American astronaut there right now, we'll have four coming. When we launch again, hopefully in October, that'll be called Crew One. Our research and development efforts will go up by 300%. That's the type of demand we have in low Earth orbit because of the microgravity and what you can develop in microgra microgravity. We're doing things like following, fo finding immunizations for sal salmonella, which you don't hear about in the United States, but in Africa, it's a big deal. We're we're mass producing retinal implants because again you can create things that you don't have the weight of gravity and you're allo it allows you to create things that you couldn't otherwise. Then those are just a couple examples. There are many others. Right. Uh, well, Jim, uh, I remember back. I watched the uh, first moon landing from Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, the late 1960s. Uh, were a very difficult time for America. Uh, some people believe that uh, the United States may be as divided today as it was then. But it was actually the moon landing, I believe, that helped to bring this country back together. Uh, you all are embarked in a very ambitious schedule to return to the moon and to go to Mars. Uh, do you believe that NASA today can help unite this country like the Apollo program did uh, 50 years ago? Yeah, great question, Mike. You know, I, you think back in 1968, which was a year before we landed on the moon with Apollo 11, and you had the My Lai massacre. There were other massacres, actually, I believe, in Vietnam that year. Bobby Kennedy was killed. Martin Luther King was assassinated. The Vietnam War was raging. Uh, and yet, when we landed on the moon the next year, it kind of just evaporated. And so I agree with you, it did unite the country. The, the act that created NASA was in 1958 under President Eisenhower and the Congress at the time. And if you read that act, it says that we're created to gain knowledge to improve the human condition of all people all people in the United States, all people on earth. And, and that is what our job is. It, it's diplomacy. It's gaining knowledge, which is gaining information. 
and and there's an economic part to it too to help the economy of the United States and the world. And we're trying to do that. Like I said, trying to expand the space economy in low Earth orbit now. And the intent is to try to take that economy to the moon. But but with that, you know, as we go through like the launch of these two astronauts, I can't tell you how many people reached out and said, you know, you've brought us together in a very difficult time, whether it's COVID or challenges we have with societal issues. There's no question. I do think it helps bring us together. But we're a very different society than we were back in 1968 with social media. You know, I was talking to our folks, and I really thought that the splashdown was going to be a big event uh, just this week. And, and it wasn't as big as I expected, and I couldn't understand why. And one of our uh, communications folks said, you know, Jim, Walter Cronkite could sit there and describe what was happening when we lost contact with the astronauts as they were coming through the Earth's atmosphere and basically they're just a plasma ball. And today people expect pictures. They don't, you know, if they can't see it, it's more difficult for them to embrace what's going on. So we didn't have that. So it wasn't what I expected. And, you know, as, as one of the old, older guys at NASA, you know, everybody else was kind of like, I don't know what he's having troubles with here. You know, they understood it and I didn't, and I was wrong. So, but, but again, that's, you know, it's trying to figure that out. It's collaboration. And, uh, and we did what we needed to do for it. Uh, we will have another crude mission. Uh, we're going to look at the telemetry and the data and the capsule from this mission to make sure everything is good. And uh, we'll be, we'll be sending uh, another capsule up uh, in October. It, it's interesting. You think about it. The, I talk about what Elon Musk has done, and it, it's about reusability. And uh, we went and saw one of the rockets uh, that had been used, and we realized it was the rocket that sent the astronauts up. And even before they got back, the SpaceX had already used it again. So within three, they have a three-week turnaround on their rockets. And these capsules, they're, they're intending to use them five to ten times. So, again, driving down the cost is going to gain uh, more people to be able to enter into the space market. I must admit, when I first learned of their business model, I was, I was a skeptic whether or not they could pull it off. With, but they're proving that, uh, that they can do it. And it's very important. Yeah, it is. And they're, 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 look, we're learning from them. They're learning from us. And we're driving them, and they're driving us. And it, it's just a really great relationship. It's been a lot of fun. Well, Jim, when I first came to Washington, I worked for the congressman in the House who oversaw NASA appropriation. And at the ripe old age of 22, I actually found myself on Air Force Two on my way to the launch of Apollo 13. And over my career, I was able to uh, uh, witness or participate in a half a dozen launches in the old Apollo program or the shuttle program. Uh, and I was able to see NASA's leadership model at the time. But frankly, everything has not been perfect. Uh, you've had things like uh, the fire aboard Apollo 1, uh, the O-ring on the Challenger, uh, the loose foam on uh, Columbia, I think you've mentioned. How did NASA learn from those catastrophic events? And do those lessons still inform the NASA of today that you read? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a tough question. Yeah. Gwen Shotwell, who uh, is right right below Elon Musk and really the, doing the day-to-day -day operations at SpaceX. One of the, she said this week, she said, this is very hard to do what we're doing. There are missteps and our job is to reduce the risks to an acceptable level. And yeah, Apollo 1, you know, the, after Apollo 1, it, they started looking at, you know, you've got tame issues and wicked issues. You know, those are wicked problems. Apollo 1 was a wicked problem. I remember it well. And 
you know, we also with SpaceX, we're talking about the successes of this last week. Well, they had a similar capsule blow to smithereens a year, well, you know, less than two years ago. And we had to look at that. And basically the investigations that went on to make sure that this was going, you know, that we were going to have a safe capsule for these guys. It was, it, this was a long process to get where we were, but it all came from Challenger, Columbia, Apollo one, and all the other challenges NASA's had. And these are these independent technical authorities that we have The you know, we have a, a safety, you know, uh, expertise, we have a medical expertise and we have a, really an engineering expertise. And they can call, they can throw the flag. And there were times before we launched that, you know, the, the technical folks were like, no way, no how. And I was thinking, my gosh, is this ever going, you know, I don't know if we'll ever do this. And yet they come together and they work out their, their, their issues. And this is, again, I go back to the word collaboration. Yes, there's a chain of command, but we have to collaborate together. And, you know, I've got to mention part of this is about diversity. And NASA through the years has had, has been a leader in diversity. Uh, we certainly are ranked very high uh, in some of the, uh, the surveys that come out each year. Um, but, you know, if any of you have watched the movie Hidden Figures, if you haven't, I urge you to watch it. And it's about four African-American women that were mathematicians brilliant mathematicians in the Apollo era. That was unheard of back then. And yet the folks at, at NASA understood that. The other part of it was, you know, at mission control, the average age of the folks that were in mission control was age 24 during Apollo 11 when we landed on the moon. You know, this is, we're not looking at age, we're not looking at color. We're looking at who, what can you bring to the table? You know, we welcome talent and we welcome it from all over the world. And we welcome it from every center of society. And as we put these teams together, the more diversity we have, the easier it is to find solutions to the challenges we have. Some of NASA's critics have made note of the fact that these uh, disasters I mentioned seem to occur about every 20 years. Yeah. And the last one was Columbia in 2003. Now, NASA's longtime mission director, Gene Krantz, once said that over time, NASA tends to become too gung-ho about the schedule and sometimes overlooks emerging issues. So as you approach these coming critical missions, uh, how are you making sure that history does not repeat itself? Yeah, great question. And, you know, when I got to NASA, people on the outside, there were people on the outside, there's a space community and, and it's a close knit group, I might, I must admit. And somebody said, you know, NASA is the bug in the amber. And, you know, today I feel like we just woke up a sleeping giant. And, you know, I'm seeing an agility I didn't see when I first got there. I, you know, we launched these guys in June and, you know, we were in the middle of a hurricane when they came down and we didn't even have these locations. So the location of where they splashed down wasn't even identified to me, at least when they went up. So there, there's an agility that's growing. But the reality is, Mike, that you, NASA has these great accomplishments. And then you, you know, human nature is you build confidence from your success. But with that confidence, you lose sight that you've always got to be wary of what you're doing. And this is where we've tried to put in these independent authorities that can question others at the agency. But even with that, you know, if hopefully we'll continue to be successful, but we have got to keep a jaundiced eye. Are we truly being as safe as we can? We, we are certainly looking on how we drive down risk, 
but I'm, I'm not kidding myself. We have got to continue to be vigilant so we don't get to that, that time frame where we're overconfident. Well, I've got one more question, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. The last launch I participated in was a classified shuttle mission over 20 years ago. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, I, I got to sit with the launch director. And uh, there was a, a glitch in the downrange uh, test. Uh, and the downrange uh, director said, uh, software is not working. So they ran a series of tests. Two tests worked, two tests didn't. The launch director said, we're going to go. At that point, the, uh, the test director literally came up to where we were sitting at the launch director's platform and got on his knees and said, I cannot guarantee this mission. And uh, the launch director, a very cool guy, said, we will run this test one more time. There was a problem because we were running out of uh, the launch window. But we ran the test one more. They ran the test one more time, and it worked. And, uh, and he said, we're going to go. And the, the countdown proceeded. Then we had dinner that night. And he told me that any one of his team could stop a launch. So does NASA still empower and entrust your employees to that extent? That is a lot of empowerment. Yeah, we want, yes. The answer is yes, and we want them to. You know, I, we trust who's in that firing control room. And I might add, I've never stepped foot in a firing control room. Not that I couldn't, and, and someday I'd like to. But that's not my job. My job is to make sure that I'm with the administrator and we're, we're following what's going on from all areas. But going back to the fire and control room, when you think about it, you have NASA and they're looking at the technical part of that launch and making sure that there are no what we call anomalies. And it's not going to go unless there are no anomalies. You also have the Air Force and they control the range. And that's a big issue because the, the weather obviously is always a key. Uh, and we had, for instance, Mars Perseverance, there was some low grade plutonium on that and you know which way the wind was blowing if things had gone wrong would have mattered so very important and when we launched the two astronauts with commercial crew we had we scrubbed it one day because there was lightning in the area we have over 30 sensors that really check on whether there's any lightning present or could be present and we've had exp uh, we ha we've had uh, times where Apollo 12 got hit by lightning twice as it was long as it launched. Luckily, you know they survived. We've had another mission where uh, it, it was there was no crew on it, but it was uh, it was I think it was for a classified program, and it we had to destruct the rocket because it was hit by lightning. These things are extremely important, and the folks that are in that firing control room know first off they know how important it is again life and safety paramount especially for the astronauts and if something were to happen whether it was crude or not it's going to either delay or cancel what we're trying to do so we're extremely extremely cautious and again we have full trust in the folks in that firing control room and yeah any you know, we urge people to be open that when we go through the launch readiness review, the words are said, is there anyone in this room that has any issues? And they go through each person and you hear, we're go for launch, we're go for launch. And, and there have been times I've seen it where there is an issue and we stop and they go back and they work on it. And, you know, luckily that time, the next day it was resolved. But we're not going to go forward unless everyone personally says that they're good with going with a launch. Well, it was one of the most impressive events I've ever witnessed. I've got to say that. Well, Dawn, I think we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. 
Thanks, Mike. We do have lots of questions coming in. Uh, and rem as a reminder, anyone can submit a question using the Q&A. Uh, Jim, the first questions uh, come in and, and relates to NASA's perspective of balancing innovation and balancing the safety that you've talked about that's such a high priority with a charge for uh, figuring out innovation. So in the COVID-19 era, healthcare professionals and scientists have been forced to try many new and untested treatments uh, as, in their efforts to save lives. How do you, throughout your career, and how does NASA try to balance those safety concerns that you talked about that are of utmost importance, and at the same time, pushing the boundaries of science and technology so you can complete those monumental missions? There's a culture of innovation at NASA. And, and I say that because uh, a great example at, at COVID started, we had all of these scientists and engineers, and, and we were really figuring out at first what, what we needed to do. And, you know, I've talked about what we, the direction we gave them, but one of the other directions, we, we went out for, for a call and said, how can we help society with COVID? And as we all know there was, the, you know, the lack of respirators at the time was just really just, you know, heartbreaking. And a scientist out at the Jet Propulsion Lab started working in his living room and started designing a respirator, a respirator that wouldn't last but four or five months so that it didn't compete with the, with, with the current manufacturers of respirators, but something that could be put out there quickly. And I think that he actually worked with uh, one of the labs uh, DOE labs, I think, uh, that, and they had a person there that was doing the same thing and was working with 3D printing to try to get it created. And so there was a collaboration there, and they created this thing, and it got FDA approved, and it's out on the market, and companies can take those plans and reproduce them. But it's that innovation that, that that's the culture we have at NASA. It, you know, it's not technical risk that I worry about. It's political risk because there's only so much time that we have to accomplish the, the direction we've gotten by the president to get to the moon in preparation to go to Mars, by, you know, to get to the moon by 2024 with the first woman and the next man uh, landing on the moon. But with that, you know, part of my challenge is to folks at NAF, some of them, I can't get them to stop working. Um, because they're the again another part of leadership is passion and commitment, and uh, you know I see it every day there. Um, but that to to create that culture, any culture, is very challenging, and it takes it doesn't take weeks and it doesn't take months. I think it takes years, and there are things we're trying to change at NASA. I mean, any hopefully any leader worth his salt is trying to do that, but. I've been blessed to be in an organization where, you know, we talk about, well, what's leadership? And it's, it's integrity, it's honesty. At NASA, it's scientific integrity and honesty, which are things that, you know, we're trying to push our, our Chinese friends with. Uh, you know, it's, it's also inspiring others. It's communications, you know, trying to, you know, we need public support for NASA to continue doing what it's doing. And the administrator and I are out trying every day to try to send the message of what we're trying to do for the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's also looking at, you know, having confidence. At, at NASA, the words are, you know, we need the data. Well, we get data and we gain confidence from that data. But these are all parts of leadership. And I'll talk a few more. You know, I, I meant I started off with creativity, so I, I got off on a tangent there. But hopefully I answered your question. Jim, you did. And, and we've got lots of questions coming in here, uh, following up to your comments about wicked and tame problems and a series of questions asking, how do you lead a team that sometimes doesn't know the solution they're looking for when there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns? How do you lead a team when you don't know exactly the outcome you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, it's a um, great question. 
you know, I go back to Mars Perseverance, this rover that's on its way to Mars. And part of that, uh, part of what it's going to try to accomplish, it's going to land in what we call the Jezero Crater, which is about the size of Lake Tahoe. And there's a there's an old riverbed that runs into it. And we think that there could be ancient microbial life there. So how are we going to find it? So we started looking at, you know, one, where are the oldest fossils in the United States? And we found out that they were at the in Australia, a place called the Pilbara Outback. And we sent our scientists there. And we weren't looking for the fossils that were there so much, but we went to learn what are the signatures or signposts that would tell us that fossils are in that area. And we gained that knowledge and we've loaded it into our computers on Mars Perseverance rover so that it can find those fossils. And, and that's, so there's something where, you know, we didn't know how to start looking for fossils and yet we used precedents on earth to be used on Mars. And what I'd say to folks on this call is there's a lot of things that have already been accomplished and you think you have impossible challenges ahead of you. And again, it's talking to people that you trust, doing the research because oftentimes somebody has already invented a solution and it's, or something that's similar that, that you can do a bank shot off of and find the solution you need. You know, the other part of it is to have a clear vision. Again, that's part of leadership is to be a visionary. I watched Jim Bridenstine, I've watched the vice president and, and the president, and they've all had, they've been visionary in what, you know, they lit a fire under NASA to get going again. And you need that, that vision so that people really start trying to look at okay with that we you know we've got to establish priorities to accomplish that vision and then build and maintain resources that are needed to obtain the objectives that are in defined in the priorities of that vision and you know in the space world there are what we call space policy directives that the president has put out president trump and those we follow those those directives to the t and it's getting back to the moon in preparation to go to Mars. It's being on the moon sustainably. And, you know, really we're looking to see whether we can use the resources of the moon through the, what we call the Artemis program, which is our, really our program. It's Apollo uh, in, in 2020. Artemis actually was a twin sister of Apollo, uh, but it's really trying to attain, attain the direct the directives that we've gotten from President Trump. Jim and Mike, actually a couple of questions coming in for both of you to weigh in on regarding what do you see the differences between leading and managing? And Jim, specifically for you and Mike, more broadly for both of you, what, what values are you looking for in leaders and how have you found that you can lead senior management uh, across the line and even lead up when you need to find answers, either with political and policy leaders or with scientific experts. Jim, first to you. Sure, you know, I've mentioned a lot of them. I, I won't get into, you know, honesty, integrity, you know, commitment, passion, communications. I, I mentioned a number of others. It, it's, um, I look back when I was nominated and a great friend of mine, a guy named John Lebanati, who was in the Secret Service and he, he said to me, you know, tell me your leadership traits. And I started telling him how I, you know, had a, you know, staff of the appropriations committee and at other management positions. And he said, Jim, that's management. That's not leadership. And I really didn't understand at the time the difference. You know, you can manage, you can manage people, you can manage organizations, but leadership is something very different. And I think it's really a performing art. And it's all the things that I've talked about, but it's also being empathetic to others. It's, it's con being kind to others, being kind to people that can't help you. Uh, people remember that. It, it's being resilient. Uh, you know, NASA, Mike talked about all the, you know, difficult challenges NASA's had. 
it, but it had to be resilient to keep going and to find solutions to those wicked issues that we had. And, you know, as well as all the canceled programs and to keep going from that. And you have administrations that aren't interested in human exploration. Well, how do you assure that we at least keep it going quietly? And those are all, you know, parts of leadership. It's emotional intelligence. It, it's humility. You know, it's here we are. We've got the Chinese who are, you know, we get asked, are you in a space race? And my response is, well, you know, we've landed on Mars four times. Uh, you know, we've got a couple three craters, pretty expensive craters, learning how to get through the Martian atmosphere, but we've done it. Uh, you know, we've landed, you know, 12 people on the moon. You know, this, you know, we've, we're sending, we've sent a, a, a probe to the sun to study, you know, our solar weather. I don't think we're in a space race, but do I want to be touting that we're leading, you know, that, you know, you know, China's coming and, and we respect that. And we, they just launched to Mars also. Uh, there's just a window of time where you can launch. And uh, so they're trying to do that also. And, but, you know, there's something called the Thucydides trap and Thucydides was a Greek general. And, and when you have a rising power, that power is easily insulted by the status quo. And they expect everyone to change and follow them all of a sudden. And then you have the status quo, and the status quo is trying to maintain the status quo. And it's happened through history, I want to say 12 or 16 times. And it's led to war most of the time. Uh, it didn't happen during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. So we have been successful as a country to avoid the, the Thucydides trap. But we're very aware of that, and we want to make sure that we are humble and that we're not looking to create conflict on Earth. Our job is to bring people together on Earth. So, so those are some of the examples to me of leadership. Mike, same question to you. Observations on the differences between leadership and management. Well, uh, over my career, I've managed, I, I have led four different organizations from 120 people to over a million people. Uh, and what I found is, is that the leader's job is to establish the vision and approve the missions to accomplish that vision. And then it's the leader's responsibility to uh, empower his team uh, to accomplish those missions, manage those missions, not to tell them how to do it, but to make sure that they have the tools and the resources to be successful. Uh, quite frankly, trusting the team always leads to better management and greater innovation. And that's exactly what we need in this very complex world today. Jim, I think we have time for one more question. And I will tell you, you have a groundswell of volunteers and future potential recruits for Mars missions and otherwise. Uh, lots of interest here on uh, what the recruitment process looks like. How, how do you build the, the NASA program team, both your astronaut corps as well as your broader NASA team? Oh gosh, Don, you, you know that uh, we're always looking for talent and it's not just astronauts, but the astronauts, the, we just graduated a class and the folks that applied for that class, there were 18,000 applicants. And we just closed another class, a couple, or an, the application process for a new class um, just recently. And I think we had 12,000 applicants. So there are a lot, there's a lot of folks that would like to be astronauts and, and we, we need them. Uh, but we also need a lot of other people. It's not just, you know, we're looking in the STEM field, in, the, in, in science, technology, uh, math, mathematics, engineering, but in reality, that it's it's much more diver broad and diverse. It, it's communications. It, it's you know accounting. It, it's there's so many parts of this organization, and I think I just urge anyone who's interested to look, you know, at at the NASA website under their employment opportunities 
to see what's out there because you may find a, a connection. And uh, it's, again, we're looking for a diverse workforce and, uh, and we welcome everyone to, to apply. Mike, that looks like that's all the time we're going to have for questions today, but I'd like to turn it back over to you and then to Jim for your closing remarks. Thank you. Well, NASA does have some standards. I asked Jim if I could go into space, and he told me I was too old the other day. But, uh, uh, Jim, uh, thank you so much for participating today. Uh, it's clear NASA has a great deal to teach all of us about uh, leading our own organization. Uh, thank you for sharing some of those lessons that uh, that uh, that you have uh, seen uh, during your tenure there at NASA. Uh, thank you again. It's great to see you. And uh, is there anything you would like to add before we finish? Well, I thank everyone one for attending, and Don and Mike, thank you for all. You know, this has been great. I, I'd end with just saying, you know, NASA embodies the human spirit's desire to discover, to explore, and to understand. And we try to do the impossible. And we don't do it to gain an advantage over others. We don't do it, you know, just for the joy of it. We do it to help humankind. That's why we're all here. And I know the people that are on this, this webinar, that's why you're here. I know the work you're doing. I was in that field for many years with Mike. And it's so important what you're doing for this country and really for the world. And, you know, that's what, why we're here. That's why we're motivated is to help others. And, yeah, these are tough times. But, you know, I'm hopeful. We, we will get through all of this and we'll do it together. And I just urge you not to give up and to keep moving forward and practice the vision that I talked about. Mike and I, we would do seminars together at the Naval Postgraduate School. And one of my, um, one of the things I tried to do was, okay, we knew we were going to get attacked. And then we had, you know, legislation created the Department of Homeland Security. And, you know, is it a perfect construct? No. I mean, the whole construct's not perfect. But, you know, if I'm you, I'm sitting there saying we could get attacked again someday. And there's going to be more federal legislation. So isn't now the time to start thinking about what that vision is? What should the next piece of legislation look like when you've got the political support to change and address the challenges that you face today in Homeland Security? And I just urge you again to try to practice being a visionary. We need you. And I just, again, I thank you for what you're doing. And I hope you'll continue and not give up. We will get through this and there will be better days. So again, thank you all. Jim, Mike, thank you again for your time today. Thank you for your contributions to the field of Homeland Security throughout all of your career. And on behalf of CHDS and our co-host today, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the International Association of Emergency Managers, the NPS Alumni Association and Foundation, and the CHDS Association. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. <laughs>